Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions, and thank you again so much for our time together. Well, as we're closing out another week of Morning Devotions with me, you still got Pastor A tomorrow morning. We're going to the services tonight. I'm beginning a new series called Refocus. I want to talk to you about, as we come out of COVID, how to focus your life in a different direction. Some of you, you didn't like the way your life was going before. COVID, maybe you like it less. But I'm going to begin to show you from the scripture what, as a Christian, we are to focus our life upon. So let's let's check our focus. We'll see you at the service tonight. Young people, if you're 18 and under, you don't even need to be vaccinated to attend. Those of you that are unvaccinated, we have the alfresco services set up for you. But it's time to get back in God's house, and that's one of those focuses. Amen? And then on Saturday and Sunday, I'm starting a new series on the preservation of wealth. And I don't know any other way to put it. I don't know how to dress it up and make it sound all spiritual. But how in the days of these financial problems coming ahead with inflation and, and devaluations and all the challenges and the higher interest rates, how do we preserve the blessings that God has given us? If we're going to leave an inheritance for our children's children, from the Scripture... How is wealth preserved in the hard times? It's going to take a few weeks to get through, but we're going to start on it Saturday, Sunday in the services. We'll see you then. But right now, let's get into Psalms 119, beginning with verse 153. And again, can I read it to you from the New Living, please? Look upon my suffering and rescue me. For I have not forgotten your instructions. Argue my case. Take my side, protect my life as you promised. The wicked are far from rescue, for they do not bother with your decrees. Now now notice this. Rescue has requirements. Rescue has a requirement of following God's decrees. Now he's asking for his life to be protected. He said, I haven't forgotten your instructions. And now please forgive me, but straight up talk. Some of you are in very difficult situations right now, and you're asking God to rescue you. But you don't want to bother with his rules. You don't want to bother with his laws. If you want God to rescue you, you you can't unscramble scramble days. You can't fix the past. But you can go and sin no more, as Jesus said. You can, all right, from today, I'm going to start doing right. Lord, how great is your mercy. Let me be revived according to your regulations. <laughs> There's that same thing again. Revived by following your regulations. We saw that again yesterday. Many persecute and trouble me, yet I have not swerved from your laws. Seeing these traitors makes me sick at heart because they care nothing for your word. Now, they may pretend but by their refusal to obey the word, they care nothing for your word. See how I love your commandments, Lord. Give back my life because of your unfailing love. The very essence of your words is truth. All of your regulations will stand forever. Beautiful, beautiful truths. As we go to prayer today, I want to pray for the young people and the seniors that have been locked up for almost two years. And young people and seniors both listen to me. I know it's going to be a little nervous going out. Please, I mean, you're human. There's going to be a little nahia in there. But it's also going to be good to get out and see your friends and see people again face to face. So let me pray for you right now. Father, the young people are starting to get out and move around. We know their insecurities. We, we know the little fears that come in because they've been locked up for so long. Father, I ask that you just take those fears out of their heart. That in your gentleness, Lord, you make your love so real to them. And Lord, let them begin to enjoy life again. Father, restore life. Restore the joys of life to all the families. As we begin to come out of this thing yet again, Lord... Let the families laugh together and play together. Let the families enjoy together. Father, let your hand be upon them. 
Father, let there be a discipline in every family not to waste money right now, but to save that money like Joseph of old and be prepared for the great opportunities that are coming for the transfer of the wealth. Father, I ask that you crown this year with your bounty, that every family that has struggled, Lord, would have the debts paid, and they'd begin the new year free and clear without any pressure. I pray for healing, Lord. Many of our people, Lord, have struggled physically, and they're still struggling. Lord, for all those stroke victims, restore twofold. Father, for all those people that have gone through cancer in these last two years, let that cancer be gone from their bodies. Restore their strength, Lord. Restore them to full health in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, for those that have gone through that long COVID and their lungs are still weak. Lord, touch those lungs and open them up and strengthen them. For those with kidney diseases, Father, I ask that you touch those kidneys and let them live. Let those kidneys begin to reduce all the toxins in their bodies and function properly, Lord. Father, we come to you and we ask for mercy. We ask for healing mercy. We ask for provision mercy. Lord, we thank you for it. And Father, touch every heart and let them be soft to you. Let every heart as they come back into your house let them be touched by your presence. Let your presence touch every heart, Lord, as you walk among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open up our hearts now and spend some time in worship.
back to Ezekiel. This morning we have the privilege of starting our Ezekiel reading in chapter 17. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. You see, that's always the nickname that God always called Ezekiel. Propound a riddle and speak a parable. So, so far in the book of Ezekiel, we have seen proverbs and parables and riddles, but a riddle is something that the meaning needs to be explained. There's something, there's a d deeper meaning. And a parable, of course, in this case, it is an allegory. It's a story. And we're going to learn something from it. So when we read it, we realize we're not, it's going to talk about eagles and twigs. And of course, we're not literally talking about literal eagles and twigs because it already clearly says it's a riddle and it's a parable. And the nice thing about this is that in the same chapter, the parable and the riddle, it's clearly laid out. The meaning of it is clearly laid out. So just before we get started on reading it, let me just kind of explain so that when we read it, we can just basically go through it because it will be very clear. The temple of God and the palace, of course, was made, both of them were made with cedars of Lebanon. So when you're going to hear about Lebanon, we're actually talking about the cedars of Lebanon that were used to make the temple and the palace. And there are two eagles in the story. This is a story about Judah, the kingdom of Judah, the audience of Ezekiel, basically. Babylon, where they were taken captive, and of course, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And the third party is Egypt. This is a story of Judah, Babylon, and Egypt. And the two eagles, the first eagle is King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, because an eagle is like the king of the birds. So when we see eagle, we're going to talk about a king. And the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, he's the first eagle. The twig that is carried off, that's King Jehoiakim. He's not even worthy to be called an eagle. He's just a twig that is carried off. And of course, he was carried off to Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar, however, even though he carried off King Jehoiakim, he placed Zedekiah as king. 
a puppet king. Yeah, he placed a puppet king over the kingdom of Judah once he carried off people to Babylon. Subject to the Babylonians, yes, but a king nonetheless. And conditions were good in the kingdom of Judah as long as they would be subservient and pay all kinds of tribute to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. However, there's a second eagle in the story, so that's a second king, and this is Egypt. So Zedekiah could have maintained this kind of a truce with Babylon, this agreement that, yeah, okay, I'll be the king, but we'll give all this this uh, bounty to to Babylon and to King Nebuchadnezzar. But he chose not to. He chose to look to Egypt for help. And Jeremiah, in fact, if you read the book of Jeremiah, one of the things he did, he was trying to stop Zedekiah from this plan because it wasn't God's will. But nevertheless, it, he was not successful. So that is basically the story of the two eagles, the twig, and we'll carry on a little more detail as we read the parable. So, thus says the Lord, a great eagle with great wings and long pinions, rich in plumage of many colors. So that means this eagle, who's the first eagle? King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He had a great reach. Many nations were under him, so he had a great reach came to Lebanon and took the top off of the cedar. He broke off the topmost of its young twigs, so that is the young twig, Jehoiakim, and carried it to a land of trade and set it in a city of merchants. All right. So Nebuchadnezzar came and took Jehoiakim and took him to Babylon, the city of trade and merchants. Then he took of the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil. He placed it beside abundant waters. He set it like a willow twig, and it sprouted and became a low-spreading vine, and its branches turned toward him, and its roots remained where it stood. So it became a vine and produced branches and put out great boughs. So this is the story of Judah under King Zedekiah that had been placed there, even though Jehoiakim had been taken away, it was good. It was all right. But he had to be subservient to Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the first eagle. Verse 7, and there was another great eagle. Who's the second eagle? Egypt. All right. With great wings and much plumage also. So it's a powerful nation. And behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and shot forth its branches toward him from the bed where it was planted, that he might water it. It had been planted on good soil by abundant waters, that it might produce branches and bear fruit, and become a noble vine. Thus says the Lord God, Will it thrive? Will he not pull up its roots and cut off its fruit so that it withers, so that all its fresh sprouting leaves wither? It will not take a strong army or many people to pull it from its roots. So God is saying, okay, Zedekiah is going to turn to this second eagle to Egypt. Is it going to work? No, <laughs> it's not going to work. And it's not going to take much of an army before it gets pulled out from these beautiful situations that it had found itself in. Behold, it is planted. Will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when the east wind strikes it? Wither away on the bed where it sprouted? Then the word of the Lord came to me. Say now to the rebellious house. So now the riddle is going to be explained. When it was explained, whether it was immediate or whether it was sometime later, it doesn't say so because it doesn't say. We don't know exactly when it is. You know, when it comes to Zedekiah looking to Egypt, when we look to the things of this world to help us, sometimes for a time, it may appear that the world is being of help to us, that the things of this world, oh, that was exactly what I needed to be of help to me. I know that's exactly what I needed, but it is so short-lived for 
only in God can we prevail. And God has his own ways. So don't look to the things of the world. People will say to you, just have a little drink at night. You know, just, you, it'll, you'll help you to unwind. While it may seem to provide temporary relief, it's going to be short-lived because it will bite you in the end. When you look to the things of this world, when you look to the people and the sinful ways of the world for your help, though it may appear to help for a time, it's not, it's not what you need. As I said, only in God can we thrive. Only in God can we prevail. All right, so here he's going to start to explain the riddle. Do you not know what these things mean? Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and took her king and her princes and brought them to him in Babylon. And he took one of the royal offspring and made a covenant with him. Who's that? That's Zedekiah. Putting him under oath, the chief men of the land had been taken away. Chief men of the land, such as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that the kingdom might be humble and not lift itself up and keep the covenant that it might stand. So, you know, that was the pattern of the kings of old. When they conquered another land, they took all of its leadership away just to avoid any future uprisings, so they thought. But he, Zedekiah, rebelled against him by sending his ambassadors to Egypt, that they might give him horses and a large army. Will he thrive? Can one escape who does such things? Can he break the covenant and yet escape? You know, when God starts asking you questions, you should stop and take note. <laughs> because sometimes... In your spirit, God will start asking you questions. Why are you doing this? Is this right? What about this scripture? What about that scripture? Are you going in the right direction? And you know, when God starts asking you questions, you need to answer honestly. And we need to mind the promptings of the Holy Spirit in our heart because he is so faithful to remind us of the ways of God and the word of God. And if we keep on hardening and hardening and hardening our hearts, eventually we'll be hardened to his voice. So when he asks questions, you should pay attention. Verse 16, As I live, declares the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwells, who made him king, whose oath he despised, whose covenant with him he broke, in Babylon he shall die. Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company will not help him in war. When mounds are cast up and siege walls built to cut off many lives, he despised the oath in breaking the covenant. And behold, he gave his hand and did all these things. He shall not escape. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely it is my oath that he despised and my covenant that he broke. I will return it upon his head. Isn't that a theme that we see in the book of Ezekiel? When we do things against God, that is the very thing that comes upon our own head. That's how God judges us. I will spread my net over him, and he shall be taken in my snare. And I will bring him to Babylon and enter into judgment with him there for the treachery he has committed against me. And all the pick of his troops shall fall by the sword. So Egypt, according to Isaiah chapter 30, and according to Isaiah chapter 36, Egypt is always useless to look to Egypt for help. And Egypt is a type of the world or sin. It's just of no use to us. It will not be profitable for us to look to the world for help instead of looking to God. Our eyes need always to look to the heavens where our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. And everybody said, Amen. So it says, the survivors shall be scattered to every wind. And you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken. Thus says the Lord, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one 
the tender one, that's the Messiah. So this passage, this paragraph, the last paragraph of chapter 17, it's a branch from David's house. Clearly, this is a messianic prophetic reference talking about the tender one, Messiah, and God will do it. And I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell every kind of bird in the shade of its branches. Birds of every sort will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. <laughs> How many times have we seen that passage or that phrase, and then they shall know that I am the Lord. And it's usually people God's talking about. But even the trees of the field will know, all of creation will know that he is the Lord. It says, I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree. Of course, the humble he exalts. Dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it. Of course, when all human plans come and go, God makes all things work together for our good. He jumps in there. He directs our paths. He holds the heart of kings. He knows the beginning from the end. He works salvation for us. His hand is mighty. His hand saves. No one can stop him and no one can snatch you from out of his hand. And so that chapter 17 is a parable or a riddle. And now you know the answer to the riddle. And now you know that ultimately, of course, you knew already, God is in charge and God will bring about salvation. Now, chapter 18, in this chapter, chapter 18, we're going to see laid out clear scriptural principles. And the most important principle from this chapter is individual accountability. We are accountable to God. We're accountable to God for our actions. We're accountable to God for who we listen to, what we read, what we put before our eyes, how we treat our fellow human beings. We have individual accountability to God. And when God says, do something, and then you just automatically go and say, oh, yeah, but so-and-so told me to do something different. God's not going to look at so-and-so. He's going to look at you in the sense that you have individual accountability to God. So the word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So there's a common saying that was going through the land and Indeed, in this common saying, this proverb, the people were implying that God was not just, that he wasn't being fair. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. I like that. All souls are mine. The soul, of, the soul who sins shall die. Now, in this chapter, chapter 18, we have an example of a godly grandfather and then an ungodly son and then a godly grandson. And if you think about it, because Ezekiel was talking to the southern kingdom of Judah, this perfectly fits the pattern of King Hezekiah who was a godly person, and then his son Manasseh, who was totally, he was so evil. He was like one who sacrificed his own children to these heathen gods, burned them in the fire. He was very evil. And then Manasseh, the grandson of Hezekiah, now Josiah, Manasseh's son Josiah, was a godly man. So a godly grandfather, an ungodly father, and then a godly grandson. And we will see that it clearly applies to that. And of course, it clearly applies to our own lives. And we need to remember that God has no grandchildren. This is 
part of this principle of individual accountability. God has no grandchildren. You cannot get into heaven on the good relationship with God of your parents and just grow up in church and think you're going to heaven. You yourself must have a relationship with God and you yourself must live for the Lord in righteousness and follow him with all of your heart. And everybody said, Amen. So here comes the story of the grandfather, the father and the grandson. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains, or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, so it's going to list some things that were common virtues, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman in her home in, in her time of menstrual impurity, does not oppress anyone but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, does not lend at interest or take any profit, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in my statutes and keeps my rules by acting faithfully. He is righteous. He shall surely live, declares the Lord God. So we have this righteous grandfather. If he fathers a son who is violent, a shedder of blood, who does any of these things, though he himself did none of these things, who even eats upon the mountains, defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore the pledge, lifts up his eyes to the idols, commits abomination, lends at interest, takes profit, shall he then live? He shall not live. He has done all these abominations. Who he? The ungodly son. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. Individual accountability. Now we go to the godly grandson. Verse 14. Now suppose this man fathers a son who sees all the sins that his father has done. He sees and does not do likewise. And that happens, right? Sometimes you see, for example, the child of divorced parents or separated parents who have second family here and there, and they are so determined, my family will not be like that. My family will serve God. Sometimes it's like that. Children see the sins of their parents and go, mm -mm, not in my house. It's not going to happen. He does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife, does not oppress anyone, exacts no pledge, commits no robbery, but gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, withholds his hand from iniquity, takes no interest or profit, obeys my rules, walks in my statutes. He shall not die for his father's iniquity. He shall surely live." As for his father, because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. So that's really clear, right? But it's not the way the people of Israel were thinking. And honestly, if we would be honest with ourselves, sometimes it's not the way we human beings think even today. Because these are the principles of God in dealing with us, and they should be our principles in dealing with other people. But isn't it true that sometimes you know somebody and his father is just a scoundrel, and your first inclination is to prejudge the son because of his father? Isn't that still our inclination sometimes? Or somebody is like something but his brother is such a good man, such an awesome Christian. And yet we tend to look at the brother with this. We paint him with the same paintbrush as his wicked brother. We just tend to be that way. And that's definitely the way the people of Israel were. But they went even further and they would say that the son should be punished for the iniquity of his father. So verse 19, yet you say, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? When the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, 
nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. See, God is trying to lay it out clearly so that they would understand. But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall remem be remembered against him, praise God. For the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God? Isn't that a good principle? God does not even take pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't take pleasure in the death of anybody. <laughs> and yet sometimes you hear people praying about their enemies. Lord, may they get cancer and die. <laughs> Lord, I, I just wish they would get COVID-19. Ooh, how how wicked is that? Because God does not take pleasure in anyone's death, not even the wicked. And not rather that he should turn from his way and live. But when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abominations that the wicked person does, shall he live? None of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered. For the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed, for them he shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall save his life. Because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions he has committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? <laughs> oh, God, trying to deal with people who have made up their minds. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his own ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed. You know, there is always and forever one solution for sin. <laughs> and it is, oh, the blood of Jesus, right? Throughout eternity, it has always been and it will always be. We see it in the book of Revelation. They will still be singing about the blood of the Lamb that cleanses us from all sin and makes us righteous with God. And carrying on, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. So turn and live. What an invitation. First of all, what a statement. <laughs> so don't go around praying that your enemy is going to get COVID-19, okay? <laughs> God doesn't have pleasure in that. In fact, pray for the healing of and the well-being of your enemy. Ouch. Turn to God and live. What an invitation. What a statement. Turn to the Lord and live. Amen. May we all do that in Jesus' name. That is our Ezekiel reading for today. Thank you so much for joining us as we have learned a lot in those two chapters.
Our New Testament passage today picks up in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And I know Sister Bev is going to go long on Ezekiel, so what do I do with the famous passage of faith? Well, we're going to try to just read through it as quickly as possible and just point out a few things to you. He says, now faith is, all right? Now faith is. Number one, what is faith? Faith is, number one, the assurance of things hoped for. Number two, the conviction of things not yet seen. Now, the beautiful little truth here is that this Greek word for conviction here literally is, uh, it's only been found one time in ancient Greek. It's literally the title deed. The title deed. Now, brothers and sisters, when we begin to understand the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, that's what faith is. And for by it, all right, what does faith do? What does faith do? For by it, the people of old, number one, received their commendation, and number two, by faith, people of old received their commendation. Now, the next thing I want you to do is just go through and do all of these by faith statements. By faith, by faith, and just highlight these. By faith, and just highlight that. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. All right, now let's just begin to break this down a little bit. These are the accomplishments of faith. The accomplishments of faith. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. You have to have faith to believe in creation. See, people say, Pastor Samaral, where, where do you stand on creation? I'm what they call a young earther, okay? And I, I like that phrase. I just heard it for the first time the other day. I'm a young earther. I believe in creation. I don't believe in gazillions of years of, of evolution. I think it takes a lot more faith to believe in evolution than it takes to believe in a sovereign, creative God. By faith, we understand the universe is created by the Word of God so that what was seen was not made out of things that were visible. So psh, nothing was there. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice. So by faith, we understand. By faith, we give. Through which he was commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. All right, he still speaks. So faith causes us to be a giver. Faith causes us to understand. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he did not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Now, please God is going to be an important thing as we go here. So by faith, we see an early rapture. <laughs> and, and really, that's kind of what it is. I mean, he was he was taken up. He never died. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, there, there's a revelation that you need to get. Now, again, notice pleased and pleased. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I call this the definition of faith. It has two parts. Believe that God exists, and number two, Believe in the character of God, that he's a rewarder. By faith, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And by this, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. All right, so by faith, he obeyed. By faith, Abraham obeyed. So here we see another obeyed. When he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, he went out not knowing where he was going. <laughs> hey, uh, 
it's one thing to know where you're going and obey. It's another thing to not know where you're going and obey. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him in the same promise. So again, by faith, he obeyed. Even though he was in a temporary situation. For he was looking forward to a city that had foundations, whose designers and builder is God. Motivation for obedience. You're looking forward to something. God has given you a revelation of something that you you know is there. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Now, wow. So by faith, we have a child. But now notice, she considered him faithful who promised. Now here's a big key of faith. Don't have faith in your faith. Have faith in the one who is faithful who promised. You just just got to get a hold of that. There are times when we are faithless, and he is still faithful, as the scripture says. Therefore, for one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of the heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of the sand by the seashore. All right, so by faith they receive the promise. This is the accomplishments of faith. But now, these all died in faith. So you can, you can die in faith. <laughs> we, we don't like to think about that, but we can die in faith. Not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles in the world. Some people die in faith, never receiving the promise, but they've seen it and they've greeted it from afar and they acknowledge who they are in relation to that promise. Now, again, here's people who died in faith, looking forward to the promise, but not having received it. See, sometimes we think that faith means we always receive. Sometimes we die in faith. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. What are you seeking? Seeking where we belong. Now, we haven't flown for a while this year, but it is not unusual when I'm flying. As we come home and we land in Nia, it is not uncommon that people begin to clap as we land on the the thing. And they're not clapping for the pilot's great landing. They're clapping to be home. And if you talk to those people, you know, sometimes the, the... Sometimes they're a couple buying in America and Canada and Australia and stuff. They come home and they talk about all this wonderful life. And it's so wonderful. But there's no place like home. For people who speak thus make it clear what they're looking for. They're looking for where they belong. They're looking for their homeland. And beloved, please, we don't belong here. This is not our home. We sing the song, this world is not our home. Our home is heaven. People of faith, people of faith, acknowledge that we're strangers and exiles here. This is this is how people of faith talk. How do these people speak? These people speak thus. Okay, this this is what they're talking like. All right, we're strangers and aliens here because this is not our home. And then he continues. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have opportunity to return. Now, folks, scary. This is a scary thought. Your thoughts determine your future. I've watched many people. All they think about is their past. And that creates an opportunity to return to their past. I see men and women looking up their old boyfriends or girlfriends from college on Facebook. And all of a sudden, they they see them in the the shopping mall. 
And they go, wow, what a coincidence. Not a coincidence at all. Spiritually, you created the opportunity by your thoughts. If you've been thinking from what you used to have that God brought you out of, then I have an opportunity to return. That will create a temptation within you. Please, focus on where God has taken you, not where you've come from. But as it is, they desire. Here's, here's the reality here. So notice we have seeking, we have seeking, and we have desire. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. This is our homeland. This is our homeland. Therefore, ah, and here's the big truth. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Oh, beloved. This world is not our home. God has prepared a place for us for eternity. And when you and I seek that place, recognizing we're just passing through this world, when you and I have a desire for that place, knowing that we're just passing through this world, God is not ashamed to be called our God because we value what he has provided for us. Let's close out today with a little bit of wisdom from Proverbs. <laughs> a wise man is full of strength. I like this. The wise are mightier than the straw. Guys, not a problem going to the gyms and building up those, those arms and that chest, building up those legs. Not a problem building up your core. But wisdom is mightier than physical strength. A man of knowledge, now here's wisdom, a man of knowledge enhances his might. New Living says, Grow stronger and stronger. Young people, do you know why your parents want you to grow, want you to study? And do you know why you should study the rest of your life? The more you study, the stronger you grow. The more knowledge you have, the stronger you grow. This is why many pastors lose their spiritual strength, because they don't study. Wow. This is why many businessmen lose their business strength, because they stop studying. They start, they start coasting. You know, they, they, already, they think that they know so much already that, you know, they can, they can stop. Have you ever noticed I study all the time? If you've ever been around me much, you don't find me without something to study. I'm always studying. Knowledge enhances might. Those with knowledge grow stronger and stronger. For by wise guidance, you can wage war. And in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Now, not just one. Not just one. An abundance. You see, different people see things differently. Different people will pick up on different things. The more counselors, the more sure victory is. See, this, this is one of the things you just got to get a hold of in life. Nobody thinks of everybody of everything, and nobody can see everything, and nobody knows all the pieces of everything. But when you get a whole bunch of people together and you get them talking, now you can put pieces of a puzzle together, and those pieces of a puzzle make victory. Wisdom is too high for a fool. In the gate, he, he does not open his mouth. <laughs> Among the leaders at the city gate, they have nothing to say. Did you see that down here? They have nothing to say. Fools shut up in the face of wisdom. Whoever plans to do evil will be called a schemer. The devising, now, now just whoever plans evil will get a reputation as a troublemaker. Have you ever noticed there are people who plan evil? They plan destruction. They, they plan to destroy people. You know what? Before long, their reputation is not a good reputation. Their reputation is the reputation of a troublemaker or a schemer. The devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to mankind. A scoffer means mocker. Everyone detests a mocker. Have you ever seen people on Facebook and all they do is mock people? They're always mocking people. They got a mocking spirit. 
Have you ever noticed they're not liked? Mockers are never liked. Mockers are always, and notice the word detests. Mockers are always detested. So when you know, you're looking at something and you want to mock it, you want to make fun of it. Show no respect for what you don't understand. Zip your lip, as my mama used to say. Zip your lip. Just nip, zip the lip. Don't let mockery come out of your mouth. It destroys your name. People have no respect for a mocker. And sometimes you want to look at young people today. They, they want to mock things they don't understand. And you want to just say, young people, you know, maybe your mama didn't teach you respect. But you need to come before the throne of God and learn some respect. Because mockery is not going to give you a good name. Mockery is going to make you, ESV says, an abomination. An abomination in other people's eyes. So if you don't have something good to say, zip the lip in Jesus' name. Amen? All right. We'll see you tonight, 7 o'clock. See you then. Mm -hmm.